Thank you for coming today. Let me uh, lift up one of our missionaries this week. We've got 60-something missionaries, and every one of them seems a favorite. This is, this is two that I really admire, Dan and Vicki Weaver, that we have supported for 20 years since August of 2002. I like to read missionary stories. I remember the story of John Patton, whose uh, wife died the first week or two. They were there to uh, talk to the cannibals about Christ. He had to sit up on her grave for about a week or two until uh, it, was, it was all settled in because he was afraid that the people they were trying to lead to Christ would, would dig her up and eat her. Now that is commitment. Well, in modern day, Dan and Vicki are in Belize. They're in the Valley of Peace, which was a refugee community at one of the civil wars uh, in the border of Belize near Guatemala. The area they're trying to reach is filled with gangs and they, uh, nine years ago in 2013, were shot at lost control of their vehicle, and Vicki had a terrible brain injury. She doesn't know now and remember much about the accident at all, but she does remember that God put it into their hearts to reach the people of the Valley of the Peace. Do you think she'll have her mind pretty clear in heaven, maybe clearer than you and I who sit over here safely? I do, unless you plan to go witness to gangs or to be like John Patton and go where they may eat you or your family. Uh, we have it pretty easy. I think the least we could do would be to honor them and hold the rope and lift up Christ through them uh, by giving and by prayer. So thank you for being part of Faith Promise Missions. These, all these wonderful stories are not just in days gone by. They really are still going on today, and they will until Christ returns. Go to Proverbs chapter 1. We're taking a break in our series exploring the people of the Bible. Just because there's millions of them, we've done 30 and there must be at least 25 more. There's lots of people in the Bible. Dr. Phillips does a masterful job. You hate to do it, but you got to have some variety. And we're going to do a six-week series called A Word to the Wise about studying the principles of wisdom in God's wisdom book, which is the book of Proverbs. Now let's read Proverbs chapter 1. I'll begin in verse 20. And again, the title of the message today is Wisdom's Final Call. Uh, Proverbs 1.20 says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the street, she crieth in the chief place of the concourse, in the opening of the gates, in the city. She uttereth her word, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you, because I've called and ye refused i have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof because of all that i will also laugh at your calamity i'll mock when your fear cometh when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind when distress and anguish cometh upon you then shall they call upon me but i'll not answer they shall seek me early but they'll not find me for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all of my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil." Every time in the Bible you see wisdom personified, remember this is God. This isn't earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom is important. Uh, there are experienced people in every field that are helpful in our lives. But God's wisdom is the ability supernaturally to receive the instruction of arranging your knowledge in a way that glorifies God. It's, it is the use of knowledge for the glory of God. Uh, the voice of wisdom in Proverbs is the voice not only of God, but really of Christ. Wisdom speaks in Proverbs. God speaks. The authority, the invitation, the warning that we just read about is from God. It's vertical. It's from heaven down to earth, from God to man. And it's really the only chance you have in integrity and uh, success in a life as a person, as a family, as a church, as a nation. We've rejected God's wisdom, and that's worked out pretty well, hadn't it? That's just really nice. I have a family member that I love very much that told me that uh, a 2,000-year-old book had little to offer to our world today. Well, what kind of books are you reading now, right off the press, that have done 
any good. To ignore wisdom in the marketplace, in the home, in the family, in the church, in the Sunday school, at the pulpit, is to ignore God and to honor wisdom is to honor God. The blessings of wisdom are the blessings of God from earth and down from heaven. Our nation, 24 hours a day, I was reading an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal telling me what the metaverse means. I had no idea that it's kind of, you're never going to even pay any attention to anybody around you. They're going to build a digital world that will absorb all other digital worlds, and you can live there almost like a a disconnected brain from your body. It's just horrific. Our, uh, our wisdom, our nation feeds on counterfeit wisdom and it was, as a result of that daily makes terrible mistakes. Here is real wisdom at the very beginning of God's book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs. In approaching Proverbs, we're approaching the gate of wisdom. And for us, you say, that's interesting. I may get around to that one day. No, the point here also very clearly is that wisdom will not always extend her hand. Uh, God is under no obligation to always strive with man. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You'll say, I'll see it coming. I doubt it. I can't remember the guy that blew up the Oklahoma courthouse, but they asked him before his execution what he would do after death. He, sh he said, I will an analyze, I will adapt, and I will attack. I thought... <laughs> No, you won't. What kind of nonsense is that? Each day, in a sense, moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, we are either accepting or rejecting God's wisdom in every part of our life. And humanly speaking, we're defined by our decisions. And if they're informed by the world's foolishness instead of God's wisdom, woe unto us. For each of us, God will sooner or later issue a final call for life or death to heaven or hell, to wisdom or foolishness, to joy or misery, to each one of us and every one of us, wisdom's final call. First thing I want you to see about wisdom, heavenly wisdom, and our responsibility to engage in it, and God's gracious offer of giving it to us, is wisdom's invitation. Wisdom is gracious and extends a final call, a gracious call. First thing I want you to see about the invitation of wisdom, and we're doing it right here. Thousands of years later, we're still gathering together to talk about the wisdom of God. My family member is wrong about that. Look at Proverbs 1 again, verse 20. Wisdom crieth. That's not just, hey, how you doing? You go, uh, you, you are passionate about what you're doing. You're crying without. She uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city. She uttereth her words. The invitation of wisdom is, and it was in days past even more so, a public invitation. It's not extended to a few people studying a mystery belief or religion. Are you a member of any groups that have meetings in buildings that have no windows and you have secret handshakes and the high sign and the low sign? <laughs> I hope you have fun, but don't think that's wisdom. That is silliness. That's silliness on the level of a fourth grade boy. That's absolutely silly. If you join some secret society or subscribe to some occult magazine seeking special wisdom, hidden wisdom, that is foolish. If it's wisdom, it's going to be public. God is not in the business of hiding it. It's no part of his, it's no part of his information plan to hide the good things from you. If it's good, give it out. Jesus Christ might be a good illustration and an example here. He said, I have done nothing in secret. Matthew 10, 27, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what you hear in the ear, preach ye on the housetops. That's wisdom right there. Keeping the faith, that's good. It's better to give it away. First thing about wisdom's invitation is it's a public invitation. Number two, it's a pressing invitation. It's not a namby-pamby, take it or leave it, good God, good devil, whatever you want to do. Look again in verse 20 and 21. Wisdom crieth without, uttereth her voice in the streets, crieth in the chief place of the concourse or the opening of the gates. In the city she does her words. This is not take it or leave it. This is not instruction interposed between yawns. There is a tear in her voice. There is a sense of urgency, emergency, and pressing to this invitation. Are you irritated when things are taken out of your private religion and talked about publicly? I'd get over that. 
No, that's not how it's going to work. Too bad. The Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's serious. If you knew, you know, uh, our young people today, uh, all the polls say, I think socialism is a pretty wise thing. Well, they've never studied communism. They've never studied uh, Cuba before and after uh, their leader. They have never studied Venezuela. Most of those people that are coming across the border these days in Texas are Venezuelans. I know we have to control it, but I, I understand why they're leaving. They are fleeing misery. You know what? They're misinterpreting all this. That's the idea. Uh, God in the garden says this, Adam, where art thou? This is not a namby-pamby answer. Uh, this is not the inquest of a detective. It's the heart cry of a broken hearted God. Number one, wisdom's invitation is public. I'm giving that today. And all um, pastors and teachers, Mark will may give it from the pulpit ever, today. I'm sure he will. Number two, it's a pressing invitation. Number three, it's a patient invitation. Most of the things that I have in, in pressing that I want you to do or you w might want me to do, we're not very patient about it. Come on, you've only got 10 minutes left on the, you know, you'll get 10% 10, 10 off buying this car if you do it right now. Do it, gotta do it now, gotta move. And you've taught your kids, if, it's, if someone's pushing you like that, the answer is no, just walk away. There's nothing like that that's legitimate. Look in Proverbs 122. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Wisdom continues to try, though you refuse, though I refuse, over and over and over and over. If you study the book of Proverbs, there's three categories of people that wisdom is trying to impact and to affect. And unfortunately, they're trying to impact and affect us. Number one, the Bible talks about the simple. I'll, qu I'll quantify that here in a minute. Number two, the Bible talks next in the progression of a fixed opposition to God. You move from simplicity to scorner. And number three, fixed in your opposition to everything right, everything good, everything just, or everything holy, you move to the fool. Number one, uh, we're talking about patience. God in his uh, mercy and his tender heartedness deals with simple people. Simple people are easily led, gullible, Careless, and a lot of people in America are not so much wicked, they're just simple. They, you say, uh, what will happen after you die? Well, I'll worry about that then. <laughs> How about that, big guy? <laughs> you know, and I go, uh, okay, well, you know, a lot of people get killed in the highway. Well, I'll go, I'll go a different way. <laughs> you know, they just, they just have a joke about everything. They're laughing. Uh, life's a big party, no serious thoughts. Proverbs 22.3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished, never thinking about a death to die, a judgment to face, a heaven to gain, or a hell to shun. The scorner is another step away from God's wisdom. A scorner is not careless so much as they're cynical. And now you have a scorner. He'll mock or she'll mock at holy things and laugh and sneer and cut the lip and shoot out the tongue. Yes, this is all three channels of your television on situation comedies. They laugh, they mock, they sneer at that which is good and right and holy because they know, and God who is, or excuse me, the devil who's using them, though they don't know that, knows that it's very hard to be serious about sin once you've laughed at it. Uh, can you remember all the bad jokes people told you years ago? <laughs> well, good, I'm glad you don't, because I do. I'm, it's, it, they just stick in your mind like burrs, uh, and that's the idea. Uh, the scorner is not so. God loves the scorner. The wisdom calls this cynic. A cynic is the man that knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, and it's just a mark of the worldly lack of wisdom of our society. We're talking about it. wisdom's invitation about the patience. He's patient with and works with the simple. If the simple rejects God's intervention, he moves on to become a scorner. God loves the scorner. Uh, number three, a man is not a sinner because he's a scorner. He's a scorner because he's a sinner. If you see somebody mocking holy things, the devil's initials are carved into his hide. That's the idea. Every time. The careless become the cynical who finally become callous. This is a fool. Uh, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. That's not t picking on people that have intellectual disabilities or challenges. This is a moral foolishness. Uh, speak to the fool, and you might as well speak to a steel 
curtain. He hates the things of God. He despises the things of God. And again, this is not mental but moral. He's fixed in opposition to God and fixed in opposition to God's ways. How did he become a fool? Look in verse 22. How long, you simple ones, will you love, mark that down, there's a heart attitude toward foolishness, simplicity. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Here's a quote, it's complicated, so I'm going to read it. When you begin to love what you ought to hate and delight in what you ought to shun, soon you will begin to hate what you ought to love. Now, that's too complicated for me, but it's talking about your heart attachment to different levels of rejecting God. You may have big plans for Friday night, and you don't want to hear about anything that interferes with them, and you, maybe you're just a, a simple person, and you're not against God. You're laughing. You'd like to slap him on the back. He's the big guy in the sky. But then you move on after things go differently in your life, and friends come up with a shake of their head and a curl of their lip, and you move from being simple to being a scorner. And when someone brings up God, you go, yeah, that's really worked great. America, a Christian nation, <laughs> What a loser. What kind of God's that? Uh, I'm not following some God that comes down and got killed. Then you begin to hate. And you become a fool, Nabal, just a, someone who is absolutely morally fixed against God. If you love simplicity, soon you'll hate knowledge. But wisdom cries with emotion and hand outstretched. We have little dogs. We, have, we sent them to obedience school. It kind of worked. We're not real mean, so we... Uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, they'll go run downstairs real quick because they want to see what the cat's eating, and they might eat some too. And they go downstairs real quick, and Nancy's running down there trying to get them. But one thing we got from the from the obedience school is this come. And you do their name, and you look right at them. And one of them just ignores that. But one of them, if I just say this exactly right, Tucker, come. Tucker, come. He'll stop, and he'll turn, and he'll run right toward me. That's... Wonderful, I like that. Well, I wish we were like that with wisdom. Wisdom says, Emmett, come, come. Put that down, turn around, turn that off. Emmett, come. Here, boy, here, boy, come on. Come on. That's it, that's it, that's it. You know what? It's good for me to come when God says something. That's the idea. And I wish I had the wisdom that our little dog had. That one comes, it knows it's going to get a treat, and I'm going to really make a big deal over it, and I'm pleased with it, and it never gets in trouble or injured if it comes. Number next, not only wisdom's invitation, a public, a pressing, a patient invitation, but wisdom's indoctrination. You say, you know, some people are just wired religiously. They are just born into a family, and they're very patient and kind, and maybe they enjoy going to church. But I can't help it if I don't understand this Bible or if I don't have any interest in spiritual things. That's not true. When your heart is prepared, God is more anxious to give wisdom than you are to receive it. It's a heart attitude. It's a reception attitude. Proverbs 1.23 says, Turn you, there we go, Tucker, come, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I'll make known my words unto you. You can know. God will tell you. He wants to tell you. Wisdom is there. Uh, correct wisdom, heavenly wisdom, a vertical wisdom, if we want it. You can know. You should know. I can know. I should know. First thing is, it's in your ballpark. This is in your wheelhouse. Number one, the repentance of the sinner. Turn you at my reproof. That means repent, metanoia, change of mind followed by a change of heart. You change your mind and you turn and God will abundantly pardon and fill up your life with his wisdom and change your life. No repentance. If God gave wisdom, that would be like pouring water on a rock. You're not in any position to receive it. Wisdom's indoctrination starts with the repentance of the sinner. You turn away from the foolishness, which you pretty much know is foolishness already, and God is very ready to give you a substitute, which is called true wisdom. Number one, the repentance of the sinner. Number two, what do you turn to? The revelation of the Spirit. Who is calling you and who's working in your heart, even though he doesn't have to, and says, you know, this is wrong. You know better than this. Turn. Go another way. Stop going where you're going. You've heard that. One definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing, expect a different outcome. Well, you've been doing the same thing for the last 10 or 15 years, and your life's pretty much no good. 
duh, think about this. Something else needs to be done. Well, thank God God does it. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. One of the uh, nomenclatures of the, of the spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom. This book is a, a revelation and a production and written by God. It's the production of the Holy Spirit. You'll never understand Proverbs to the depth which God intends to be understood until God pours out his spirit unto you. He may mercifully uh, make your heart tender and lead you to him in salvation. Or if you are saved and just walking in worldly wisdom and leading a third-class Christian life, he can turn the light on in your soul after you turn to him at salvation or at the repentance of a sinner or at the correction of a believer. You memorize facts. It's good to memorize facts. good to memorize especially Proverbs, but he reveals truth. Number one, you turn the repentance of the sinner. Number two, he is always ready to act and probably was the one and certainly was the one that made you uh, think about turning the revelation of the spirit. What do you turn to? I read all sorts of stuff. I read, I just got, it's sequencing is my problem. I, 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 I read World Magazine. Do you read World Magazine? World Magazine is printed in Asheville, North Carolina. It's a, a biblical Presbyterian. It's like the PCA church. They're not exactly where we are, but about 99% better than most of the magazines I read. Very well written. Uh, I read the Wall Street Journal. I like to know what's going on. Nothing wrong with that. As long as I read the scripture and the wisdom of the scripture every day. My, my main, main, main issue with wisdom in my life for years is sequencing. Seek ye first, add that in. No problem if I am working on my Sunday school lesson and, and uh, working on wisdom and memorizing. I'm memorizing Ephesians 4, 29 to 5, 3 now. There's too many ands and ifs and ors. I get the big picture, but I get all tangled up on which ones are ors and ands. If I, so if I do that first, there is no problem with reading about what's going on in the world. Uh, it's sequencing. What is the next sequence when you turn from and you turn to the reliability of the scripture? You know what it says in verse 23? I will make known my words unto you. Okay. You know who makes his words known unto me? Daniel Henniger writes a good essay in the Wall Street Journal every week. Peggy Noonan, she was a speechwriter for Reagan. She is a way with words, and she's a very wise woman. She's a Catholic, but she has enough biblical background. It's just really enjoyable to read her. Well, those people are good, but this is God saying, I will make known my words unto you. And he's going, Emmett, sequence. Emmett, come. Emmett, come. <laughs> come on, boy. Turn away from that. You can read that later. Do first things first. Come. This book is the word of God and contains the thought, the mind, the intent, and the will of God. I enjoy reading all sorts of things, and you probably do too. I've already got five people. I hope are the next president. You know, I'm just always studying what these people are saying, and I really think a lot of them. But this is a categorically far above that, wherever you are politically. This, again... The minds, the thoughts, the intent, the will of God. That's it. Uh, Matthew 4, 4, you know that section in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 where Jesus is tempted by the devil. Jesus has no super-duper graduate-level psychological insights. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So first things first. Just, just make sure you're up to date on your memorization and your study and then you've got whatever time you have left which usually there's not much time after that which is another blessing you're too tired to read about foolish things you go on to bed uh, that's wonderful second timothy three sixteen, all scripture given by inspiration of god profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works you know what that is uh What's right, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay right. That's the ballpark. That's the entire field. You got it covered. That's, that's the sufficiency of God's wisdom book. Proverbs 2, 6 and 7. Wisdom is what we need. Guess what? The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up, heaps up, treasured up. Sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler 
to them that walk uprightly. Now you've got wisdom. Now you can deal with the other levels of human wisdom in your life from a sound footing. And especially if you're doing it the same day, you think, huh, it's a crazy idea. I know that's wrong. Let me go to the next sentence. You are on track. You can have wisdom. And in so reading the wisdom of the word of God, you can have the mind of God. He does give such. He can. He does. And he will. You say, well, that's a very happy thing. Wisdom is clapping his little chubby hands, and he's just real pleased if we read a verse. No, wisdom is an alive person. The next step is not only wisdom's indoctrination, it's wisdom's indignation. Did you know God can become indignant? Uh, R.C. Sproul's in heaven now, but he said the difference between theology uh, a thousand years ago or in the early church and now is in the old days, people were very concerned that man was very, very bad and God was very, very mad. And now, hey, I'm okay, you're okay. We're not so bad, God's not so mad. It's just a kind of a happy, just a kumbaya moment. And, you know, it's, it's our best life now if we'll just follow those rules. No, that's not it. Al Mohler says that the theology of our day is benign therapeutic deism. It's okay. We're looking for a little bit of help here. I just need some, maybe I'll sit down and talk with you or schedule a time just to get some tips and ideas about my best life now. And God, oh yeah, God's the big guy in the sky. He's just, he's great. Yeah, my, uh, we, we believe in God at my house. Okay, now we do what we want. No, that's ridiculous. Uh, the Bible's full of truth and the God of heaven when his name and his nature and his righteousness is scorned or mocked can become indignant. He is not a tame lion. Just deal with it. You may think everything's okay. God doesn't think everything. God doesn't think you're okay, I'm okay, it's okay. He says you're not okay. I'll make you okay if you'll turn to me. That's the idea. Nahum 1.6 says this. Now this is not the God of Joel Osteen. This is not the God of Norman Vincent Peale. It's not the God of most cable channels. Nahum 1.6 says who can stand before his indignation who can abide in the fierceness of his anger his fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him uh, is there another god up there we don't like this one this one is too uh, sharp elbowed hebrews 10 27 but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries question why does God and when does God's wisdom become indignant? Well, that's where we are today. Look back in Proverbs 1 and verse 24. Because I've called, Tucker, come. Now, the dog doesn't come. We're going to have to get the little newspaper. Not very hard. We're soft-hearted. We're going to go, no, no, don't do that. And you know why? Because we came and you wouldn't call. Not because we're mad, but because food, pleasure, source of all joy is is to go to your master. That's the idea for a dog. And it's and we're we ought to be like that to God. That's the idea. Verse 24, because I have called, ye refused. Wrong choice. Wrong choice. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. You talk to your grandchildren. Stop that, put that down. They don't do it. Wrong choice. Okay? You can't let them get away with that. They'll, they'll do that when they run out in front of a car in the street or something. You're not mean. You're trying to help them and, and save their life. Because I've called, ye refused. I stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. Think of every television commercial you saw yesterday. Probably 84% of them said, no, we're not going to take your counsel. And we don't care about your reproof. Matter of fact, we don't even think you exist. What do you think about that? That's ridiculous. Uh, because the call of wisdom is time and time and time again swept aside. Guess what? There is a deadline. The spirit of God will not always strive with the spirit of man. Again, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You say, I don't believe that. That's exactly the point. <laughs> You're wrong. That's exactly the point. There is a deadline. God will not always strive with man. There is a time when invitation turns to indignation. 
you, you, really, you really are making a mistake here. You can refuse the call of God and the wickedness of your heart and the stubbornness of your will. When that happens and when man resists, God becomes indignant. You can choose, and because of that, you can refuse, but you can't choose the consequences of refusing. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. The law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. You say, I don't believe that. Every meal you eat, if they're not little tiny seeds, is proof of the law of the harvest. You're a fool not to believe that. That's the idea. Saying no, you can bring down upon your head, your family, your wife, your husband, your children, the wrath and indignation of the God of heaven. You say, I just don't believe that. I know that's why I'm talking about it. You're wrong. It's true. Absolutely. I, I believe uh, very much, the more I read the Bible, in the sovereignty of God, but not fatalism. And one of the main verses against absolute fixated fatalism is Matthew 23, 37 through 38. This is that thrice holy God of heaven who is absolutely sovereign in everything. I believe that. But listen to what he says. Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he's got a tear in his eye. He wouldn't have a tear in his eye if he was a robot. Which thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent down unto thee, how often would have I gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He wanted it to happen. It didn't happen. That means they had a choice about it, okay? Ye would not. I would, but ye would not. If Jesus Christ cried about it, it wasn't robotic or automatic. It was a terrible choice they were making, and they were going to reap the horrible consequences. You sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. That's the idea. You try to have your cake and eat it too, you'll have a crummy tomorrow. It's not going to work. Hand outstretched today. America, we talk about this all the time. It's, a, it's true. A one-day invitation turns to indignation. God's going to say, it's enough. I know everything, and I know that you thoroughly understand this, and you, you just have one answer to everything I've said the last 12 years. No. You just say no. Fine. I suggest that you pray in your heart, God, thy will be done. But if you refuse it, God's going to honor you and say, okay, thy will be done. Good luck. I'll be around if you need me, but I don't think I'm going to answer. You, you, there's a line that can be crossed. You say, my goodness, where is it? We don't know that line. It's very important to know that there is such a line because that explains sometimes some people, even hopefully not ourselves, but we don't know that, so we have to keep going on and doing our best to talk and to give out God's truth. Uh, but there is a line. That's the idea. Hands stretched out today, invitation turns to indignation. Number one, here is the derision of the sinner. God's, and this is just filling our downtown streets on the west coast and the east coast in the middle of America everywhere look in Proverbs 124 I have called ye refused I have stretched out my hand no man regarded ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof I also will laugh at your calamity I'll mock when your fear cometh you say is that the God of heaven what kind of God do you believe in what kind of, what kind of God have you taken uh, Pals has a cotton candy shake. That's the first mistake I've ever seen them make. I just can't imagine that that's going to be good. Cotton candy is just, there's nothing there. I'll talk to him later if I can get a hold of him. <laughs> but uh, you, you, just, you just hate to make mistakes. You, you think, I will mock at your calamity. I will, I will laugh at your, at your troubles. That's the idea. Don't make these mistakes. Wisdom laughs and mocks the sinner. People mock God in his wisdom, but there's coming a time when the mocker shall be mocked and the scorner shall be scorned. You say, God wouldn't be like that. He is. He is not a fool. And his, you read it in the book of Romans, his time that he's giving us is not because he's just a stumbling, bumbling fool. It's because he has a deep heart desire that you would turn from this foolishness and turn to him. If you won't do it, you won't do it. It's a serious thing to be a human being made in the image of God. You won't do it. You won't do it. You bear the fruit of that. 
In Psalm 2, the Bible says the Lord shall have them in derision. Why, to the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, he that sitteth in the heavens will laugh. He will have them in sore derision. Hey, good luck. Give it a try. People do that to me. They come in. They pay $100 to come see me, and then they sit and give me a lecture for 18 minutes. And I go, well, it's good to talk to you. See you later. <laughs> but, and you know what? I say, well, you know, if there's anything I can do to help, they tell me about all the Cousin Fred stories and what they took and, and the Cousin Fred's feeling great. I say, I'm thrilled. That's great. I think, why are you coming to see me? You've got Cousin Fred. You know, you're giving this story. Uh, that's the idea is is you, you, you've either got, you've got your wisdom, you don't need mine. Well, that's fine in every part of life, especially God's part of life. We say we don't need your wisdom. Why? They're reaping what they're sowing. You sow mocking, you'll reap mocking. You say, well, that's kind of rough. Are you sure about that? It seems to be what's going on here in Proverbs 1. You reject God, he'll reject you. You scorn God, he'll scorn you. If you do it far enough, you say, I don't like that. I don't either. That's not how I want God to work in my life. Guess what? It's up to you. You say, well, I'd like some help. Help's available when you turn from yourself and you turn to God. You say, I really need mercy. Mercy is available. Today is the day of mercy. You've got it. Come to Christ. Turn from your wickedness. You're thinking, well, I don't want to do that. I'd, I'd like just a lot of money. Well, if you work hard, you'll, you'll probably be able to take care of your family, and that's usually how it works. We can't guarantee that, but we hope it is. Uh, if you sow mocking, you reap mocking. If you sow derision, you'll reap derision. You reap what you sow. And you know what you get back here? The law says you'll get back absurdity, irony, and derision peeling from wisdom's mouth about you. God's not a joke. You may think he's a joke. You may say he's a joke. You may say that at the water cooler at work. God's listening there. It's not a joke. You're the joke. And it's appropriate that people should laugh at you. This is a sad word. Not only the duration of the sinner, but the desolation of the sinner. Look in verse 27. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Rejecting God, you get what the world and you have to offer without God, which is nothing. You've seen the television shows about the whirlwinds that just sweep the ground and just absolutely blow out every window and, and knock down every building. Nancy's grandmother's from Mayfield, Kentucky. You've seen what happened to Mayfield, Kentucky uh, during the, the big storms. We've been up there dozens of times, and now it's just a disaster. My, my, my mother's from West Memphis, Arkansas. She was Miss West Memphis, Arkansas in 1955. That's the only royalty I come from. I got her a little picture in the paper and uh, with her little tiara on, uh, 17 or 18 years old. You know what, West Memphis, Arkansas, Tornado Alley is what it is. You go across that big Mississippi River Bridge and past about 15 miles of soybeans where there is nothing and the, and the tornadoes go to play on vacation. They just rip and shred everything. This is what's going to happen to you. Uh, you'll miss God's final call. If you reject him, it will be over. The last call will be ushered in, and you won't know it's the last call. That's why it's always dangerous to re resist and reject God. There will be no other call. Everybody in heaven now knows, and you'll know one day when it's too late, that your house is left unto you desolate. The derision of the sinner, the desolation of the sinner, the destruction of the sinner. Verse 27, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. You know these, these tornado chasers? I worry about that. I mean, our dogs would chase cars if they ever got off the leash. And they'd be dead dogs very quickly. Tornado chasers, and they just go, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. I go, no, no, it's not. Playing with 18 wheelers, like uh, dogs in the traffic with 18 wheelers, you're going to lose. You know what we call, I love motorcycles, but watch out. You know what we called them in medical school? Donor cycles. You're not going to do that well. I mean, I, if, and again, life's, I'm not against, I'm for motorcycles. That's the dangerous thing. I think they'd be fun. But either murder cycles or donor cycles, because they just are, it's dangerous. This, but not dangerous compared to this. Last call, no other call, your house left unto you desolate. Now as a cyclone, as a tornado, whirling, churning, biting, devastating. Question, tough guy tough girl, who can stand against a tornado? I'm a tornado chaser. 
<laughs> well, you were. Uh, if you ever caught one, that'd be the last one you'd ever chase. That's the idea. Not only Annie M and the cow and the dog are up there in the tornado, they can see you up there going, ah! Well, that's how people do now. <laughs> this illustrates God's righteous judgment. You know who's going to be swept away? The simple are swept away. If you stay right there, you're not, you're not in good shape. The scorner is going to be swept away. You just mock and you know the value of everything, but the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Guess what? That's not, that's not a, a, a way to live. The fool, all swept away. A lot of God's choices of servants were fools. Again, John Newton, there wasn't a more godly man later in life than John Newton. He was a fool who actively destroyed the faith of everybody on the slave ships. He worked on the galley boys and sat up at night with them watching the waves and teaching them to sing uh, vile songs and teaching them that there was no God and making fun of everything their parents had taught them. He said, I know that I was used by the devil to send a bunch of young men to hell and it just disgusts me. That's the idea. Finally, the desperation of the sinner. Look in verse 28. Then shall they call upon me. Now you have made fun. God's given you time. The time's up. Maybe you even know it now. I don't know. For that they, excuse me, then shall they call upon me, but I'll not answer. That's pretty bad. They shall seek me early. They won't find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose. Again, you have a choice in this. As to, and you don't get to choose the outcome, but you can choose what you believe. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised, here's the modern American education system, get God out of here. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, it's not God that did this. They did it. If you go to heaven, give God every bit of the credit. If you go to hell, it's your problem. You chose that. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. God, thy will be done. That's the, the uh, sign that God's working in a penitent heart and he's melting and he's getting ready to enter in gloriously. And when you reject God and you reject God, when you reject God, God finally just snaps off those gloves and said, I'm through. Your will be done. He doesn't say, I'm going to get in there and just beat you up because I'm a torturing, evil, mean God. He says, you want it? Life without me, you got it. I'm life, you're death. I'm joy, you're misery. I'm wisdom, you're foolishness. I'm knowledge, you're ignorance. I am fellowship, you are divisiveness. You're going to live a life of absolute misery. And you know what? It's your choice. Uh, now, when it's too late, the cry goes up. Um, I had a patient at my, when I was an intern, it was the first, I have about five or 10 bad alcoholic cirrhotic patients all the time that just destroy their liver and that's just miserable. But this was probably the first one I ever treated. This guy was probably 40, he looked 70, in a wheelchair, couldn't walk, asterixis, liver flap, skin, skin blotches all over him. Um, he just, he, he was dead, he was dead three weeks later. I was 25 years old. He sure picked the wrong person to help him. I didn't know much of anything, but there wasn't anything to do. He looked at me, and I took his history, and he, 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 he just finally had drunk himself into a just death. And he looked at me, and he said, help me. Help me. And I said, I thought, there's nothing I, nothing I can do. I mean, if, there, if there's anything I can do, I would. But you'd have to be in a time machine to go back and undo what was done. We see there's coming a time when lost sinners will stand before the judgment bar of God and say, God have mercy, it's rumored. And I read it in my mother's Bible that you are a God of mercy. And everybody there will say it's too late. If you want mercy, you can have mercy. But today is the day of mercy. That's the idea. Uh, you want love or grace, this is the day of mercy, love, and grace. Uh, wisdom calls, hand outstretched, repent, Turn, receive, come, turn and live or choose to die. There is a deadline and wisdom is making her final call. If you say no to the God of grace, you say yes to the God of judgment. Plan B is God hasn't changed. Uh, and, and the God of judgment will handle your case 
and, and, say to you, and, and say no to you. He forgives. He stands ready to apply it to your case. But if the time is now and the tornado of judgment comes tomorrow, it's too late. You say, well, surely there's more time than that. I hope there is. God's very gracious. But there, this Bible says that there is a deadline. J. Harold Smith said there was God's three deadlines. You remember that famous sermon? Love and grace and mercy rejected will leave the field. And coming on now to play the last quarter of your game is judgment, fury, and wrath. You say, well, it was kind of fun making fun of mercy and grace and all those namby-pamby loser Christians. Well, you wish they were back, but guess what? They're gone. They've got a different future. Uh, how can a God of love do that? He doesn't. You do that. Verse 31, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way, be filled with their own devices. That's the idea. What is coming on you is, again, no more than the Galatians 5, law of the harvest, on your life. God is calling, hand outstretched, word can be opened, spirit can fill you, but today is the day, tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. We've talked about this. I know you know it. Tomorrow doesn't exist. If you wake up tomorrow, it's today. Yesterday's like a dream, and tomorrow may never come. Today's the only day. There is no other day. Don't redline this manner. You'd, you'll miss God's final call. That's the idea. Well, we got to. This is just the first one. There's five more that we have in this series on wisdom from the Book of Proverbs. And if our world ever needed wisdom, it's today. I, uh, I think it was about what was it? Bible. They had a Bible class in school. I know in Granger County they won the, the battle over that. But there was a big argument about whether to let kids out for a voluntary Bible class during the day. And oh, the newspapers and the news center were going crazy. And I never write letters in the newspaper, but I wrote one that day. And I said, you know, if ever our world is crying for any kind of wisdom, hope, help, answers, this is not the time to be shutting down the only ones that's proven to work. And they just went berserk. I didn't even read them because I didn't want to get all wound up over it. But our world is, is almost desperate enough, I think, to listen if we can live out these principles. So anyway, the next five weeks are going to be good on these principles of wisdom. Oh, there's a sign up there. I believe we have, what time is it this Saturday? Five o'clock. I know you're worried like I'm worried about clothes getting too loose and falling off. Well, if we can go, <laughs> if we can go to Farmer's Daughter, We'll be safe. I think we'll be okay. So if you can meet us up there, Farmer's Daughter, you know where it is. Go on exit 23 and turn right, and you, you'll get back there. Um, 5 o'clock, Saturday, October 1st, we will cure the, the concern you have about your clothes getting too big and too floppy. We will take care of this. You'll be all right. You'll be among Baptists. We'll link arms <laughs> and move into the restaurant. <laughs> Father, thank you for the, the, our class, and thank you for our activities. Thank you for wisdom, and thank you for the Bible. Amen. Okay.